Hey there, wonderful souls, and welcome back to another soothing session on our YouTube channel. Your presence here is truly cherished, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to guide you through a tranquil journey tonight. Imagine yourself nestled in a cozy haven, surrounded by the comforting embrace of soft blankets and the gentle flicker of candlelight. Ah, our outside the symphony of raindrops orchestrates a harmonious lullaby, inviting you to let go of the worries of the day and embrace the tranquility of this moment. Surrender to the enchanting harmony of storytelling and rain, and let yourself be carried into the arms of a tranquil slumber, where the worries of the world dissolve and only peace and calmness remain. So, my dear friends, settle in, breathe deeply, and allow yourself to be cradled by the tender embrace of this experience. Once upon a time, in a small village nestled among rolling hills, there was a little cottage where an old grandmother lived. Her name was Grandma Lily, and she was known far and wide for her enchanting storytelling and her magical remedies for sleepless nights. Her cottage, with its thatched roof and colorful garden, was the coziest place in the whole village. It was a place where people sought refuge from their worries and found solace in Grandma Lily's soothing presence. On one particularly rainy evening, the wind whispered through the trees, and the rain pattered gently against the windows of Grandma Lily's cottage. The flames in the fireplace crackled and cast a warm, golden glow across the room. The shelves were filled with old books and jars of colorful herbs, while the aroma of freshly baked apple pie wafted through the air. In a corner of the room sat a little girl named Emily, with her big, curious eyes fixed on Grandma Lily. Grandma, tell me a story, she pleaded, wrapping herself in a knitted blanket. Grandma Lily smiled kindly, her eyes twinkling with the promise of a delightful tale. Once, in a faraway land, there was a little squirrel named Jasper, she began. Jasper was different from other squirrels. He could never seem to find a cozy place to rest, especially on rainy nights like this. As Grandma Lily's tale unfolded, Emily found herself transported to the magical forest where Jasper lived. She imagined the tall trees dripping with raindrops and the forest floor carpeted with colorful leaves. She felt the chill in the air and the soft rustling of the wind through the branches. Jasper scurried through the forest, his tiny paws barely making a sound. Grandma Lily continued. He searched high and low for a dry, warm spot to rest his weary body, but every tree he climbed was too damp, and every hollow he found was already occupied by other animals seeking refuge from the rain. Emily's eyelids grew heavy as she imagined Jasper's plight. The soothing sound of Grandma Lily's voice, combined with the warmth of the fire and the rhythmic patter of the rain, created a lullaby that seemed to embrace her. Finally, Grandma Lily whispered, Jasper stumbled upon an old, hollow tree with a small opening at the top. He climbed inside and found a cozy nook filled with soft, uh, dry leaves. <laughs> the rain tapped gently on the tree's trunk, creating a lullaby that lulled Jasper into a deep, peaceful sleep. Miss Emily's head nodded, and she drifted into a sweet slumber, dreaming of Jasper snuggled in his newfound sanctuary. Grandma Lily gently carried her to bed and tucked her in, whispering a soft, enchanting spell to ensure the most restful sleep as the night deepened and the rain continued, its gentle serenade, Grandma Lily sat by the window, watching the silvery droplets dance in the moonlight. With a heart full of love and a smile on her lips, she knew that on this sleepy, rainy night, everyone in her cottage would find solace and peace. 
just like Jasper, the little squirrel in the magical forest. In a forgotten corner of a lush, ancient forest, where the trees whispered secrets and the earth exuded an enigmatic aura, there lay a secluded cottage. Oh, the cottage belonged to an eccentric old man named Professor Atticus, who had spent decades studying the mystical properties of the forest. The area was known for its peculiar weather patterns, and when the rain arrived, it brought with it a spell that would envelop everything in a drowsy enchantment. On a particularly dark and stormy night, also with rain pelting against the windows in a wild rhythm, Professor Atticus was engrossed in deciphering an ancient manuscript. His small, cluttered study was filled with peculiar artifacts and mysterious books, and the faint aroma of brewing potions hung in the air. The candlelight flickered, casting eerie shadows on the walls as the storm outside intensified. Just as the professor's tired eyes began to droop, a gentle knock echoed through the cottage. Startled, he opened the door to find a young traveler, drenched and weary, seeking refuge from the relentless downpour. The traveler's name was Alex, and his eyes sparkled, gurgled with a curious mix of exhaustion and wonder at the mysterious surroundings. Come in, my child, the professor said, his voice echoing with warmth and wisdom. On a night like this, the forest is known to cast a spell of drowsy enchantment. But fear not, for within these walls you will find safety and solace. As Alex settled into a cozy armchair by the fireplace, the professor brewed a steaming pot of herbal tea that emitted a calming fragrance. The rain outside lashed against the windows with increasing fervor, weaving a hypnotic melody that seemed to beckon to the sleepy recesses of the mind. Professor, Alex began, his voice barely above a whisper. Do you have any stories about the magical influence of this forest? Stories that might lull me into a deep slumber, undisturbed by the storm? The professor's eyes gleamed with ancient knowledge, and he began to recount the legend of the weeping willow at the heart of the forest, whose boughs were said to sway in perfect harmony with the rain casting a spell that lulled all living creatures into a tranquil sleep. He painted a vivid picture of the willow's tears blending with the rain, creating a mist that carried dreams into the minds of those seeking rest. As the professor's tale wove its intricate web around Alex's consciousness, the rain's melody grew softer, and the shadows in the room seemed to embrace them both in a comforting embrace. Alex's eyelids grew heavy, and he found himself drifting into a deep slumber, cradled by the enchanting embrace of the rainy woods and the ancient tale of the weeping willow. In the hushed stillness of the cottage, the rain continued its soothing serenade, leaving the professor to watch over the slumbering traveler knowing that the magic of the forest would protect him until the first light of dawn. Across from a moor in Scotland, there once lived a lad who earned his living as a beekeeper. Though he lived by himself in a cottage, he wasn't at all lonely, maybe because he felt a connection with his bees. In warm weather, when heather blooms covered the moor, the bees buzzed about with a satisfied kind of hum, sipping nectar wherever they liked and he felt happy for them. In late fall, when wildflowers became scarce, their buzzing became more erratic, and he understood their anxiety. Sometimes the lad complimented his bees on an especially large batch of honey, and they seemed to buzz about in pleasure and pride. Folks in town said the lad could talk to the bees. Of course that couldn't be true, but in a way he felt they knew each other very well. One evening, as the lad was checking his beehives, two hounds suddenly appeared from across the moor, 
barking wildly and dashing directly toward him. The object of their chase soon became apparent when a white hare leapt out of the heather into his arms. Quickly, the lad tucked the terrified animal under his jacket. The two hounds circled his legs, barking angrily. He picked up a stick and swung it around. Eventually, the dogs gave up and bounded away. When the dogs disappeared from view, the lad set the hare back on the ground and returned to work. But instead of hopping into the thicket, the hare followed him, twitching its nose and eyeing him steadily. He went inside his cottage, and the hare ambled in behind. Well now, you act like you want to be my pet, he said. It looks like you expect dinner. I suppose I might have a carrot for you. He let the hare nibble on a carrot while he scooped some stew into a bowl for his own dinner. When they had both finished, the hare jumped onto his lap, and he stroked its head and ears. Ooch, he said with surprise. I've seen black or pink eyes on a white hare, but how did you get those blue eyes? The hare responded by stretching its back for more petting. The next morning, he took the hare to the hives to introduce her to his bees. He knew that changes in their environment can alarm bees, and he didn't want the presence of the hare to unsettle them. So he held out the hare for them to inspect her first, then set her down close to his feet. The bees dipped down and spun around her face, but she didn't seem to mind. After they satisfied their curiosity and returned to their hive, he took the hare to the next beehive for another round of introductions. One afternoon, a few weeks later, the lad noticed an old woman ambling along the track across the moor. Thinking he might sell her a fine comb of honey, he met her at the gate. Before he could speak, however, she pointed to the hare, who was peering out from behind a heather shrub. You don't see that every day, said she with a crooked smile. A blue-eyed hare. Indeed, said the lad, turning to admire his pet. What do you want for her, said the old woman. She's not for sale. Surely you have your price, lad. Now look at this bonny piece of gold. It's not every day you are offered a piece of gold for a common hare, now is it? She's not common, and she's not for sale, frowned the beekeeper. At once the old woman, whom the lad had thought much too old for such friskiness, sprung over to grab her. A bee hovering nearby gave a loud shrill, a sound that surprised the old woman and apparently alerted the other bees. In moments, a dark swarm had gathered and rushed to attack the old woman. Eek! she cried, spinning around and running away. You'll be sorry you didn't hand over the worthless hair when you could have. The next day at the marketplace, when he was selling his honey, the beekeeper shared what had happened with the baker, who tended the stall next to his. Surely the woman was a witch, said the baker, arranging his bread, potato scones, and meat pies into neat rows. Take my word, you better be careful. Aye, agreed the seller of sweaters and kilts on his other side. She's a witch, no doubt about it. But the lad thought, then again, these two often think people are witches. It could have been just a strange happenstance. Still, just in case, that night he barred his windows and locked his doors. From then on, he kept a close eye on his hair at all times. The summer passed. By the time frost lay on the ground in the morning, few flowers and very few bees remained out in the cold air. Most of the bees had already retreated to the hives, where they began their cold weather work of keeping the hive warm enough for their queen to lay her eggs. One chilly October morning, the lad was setting trays of sugar water inside the beehives when a gypsy caravan rolled by on its way southward. He waved to the driver, and a young gypsy man waved back. Much later, the lad noticed a sack of grain 
lying in the road just past the gate. Oosh, it must have dropped from the gypsy van. They'll never know it's missing till they set up camp tonight. By then, it'll be too dark to come back looking for it. So the lad hoisted the sack onto his cart and took off, following the tracks that the gypsy van had dug behind in the earth. In an hour or so, he caught up with them. He hailed them. When they stopped, he handed the young gypsy driver the sack of grain. Do you mean to tell me you followed us all this way to return a sack of grain? said the young gypsy man. Most folks are more than glad for us to go and to never see us again. Why shouldn't I bring it back to you? said he. Else I'd have to think about your poor horses missing their dinner tonight. Just then, the hare poked its head out from under the beekeeper's jacket. And what is that? said the gypsy lad. A blue-eyed hare? Yes, he said with pride. She's a special one, she is. More than special, I'd say, said the gypsy fellow. Grandma, he called inside the van. I want to show you something. An old woman with a bright headscarf, long pleated skirt, and puffed white blouse stepped out of the van. Now, what do you think of that? said the gypsy man, nodding toward the hare. Oh my, said the grandmother. It's only a hare, said the beekeeper. The old woman shook her head. Not at all. What else could she be? Tis a lassie, said the grandmother. A lassie who's been bewitched. The beekeeper gasped. Then he spilled out his story. He told them both about the two dogs who chased the hare across his moor, the strange old woman who had tried to grab her, the bees who forced the witch away, and what his friends at the marketplace had said about the old woman. Your friends are right, said the grandmother firmly. That woman was a witch, and no doubt the very one who bewitched the lassie. One thing you can count on, she will come back. She's biding her time for the lassie, that she is. What is she waiting for? All Hallows' Eve, I suspect, said the grandmother. She knows the bees will be back in their hives by then. But most important to her, that's the one day of the year when the magic of witches is the strongest. What can I do? he said, alarmed. Tell me, did you say you can talk to the bees? Not exactly talk. Hmm. However you talk to them, you may need their help. When you go home, explain to the bees that the witch may return. Before the sun sets on All Hallows' Eve, tie a good strong cord around the hare's neck and shoulders and keep her on your lap till past midnight. That sounds fine, said the lad. Do you think this will be easy, said the grandmother? When she's under the witch's spell, she may pull and jump with a power that will shock you, but you must hold her tight. If the bees can help, all the better. The old woman took a deep breath and looked at him with her old watery eyes. That's all I can say. Other than that, what will be, will be. When the lad returned to his cottage, he carried the hare from hive to hive repeating what the old gypsy woman had told him. On the one hand, he felt a bit silly explaining all of this to a mass of bees. Yet by their collective sounds, they seemed to murmur in understanding, as a person would do who was listening. And when the lad stepped away, he sensed a building excitement from within the hive. On All Hallows' Eve, the beekeeper tied a strong cord around the hare's neck and shoulders and set her on his lap. There she stayed contentedly until the darkness settled so thickly that he could only see the profile of her white fur. Then suddenly the hare lurched so powerfully that he could barely contain her. She twisted with such might it was all he could do to keep her from sliding out of his hands. Just as she started to wriggle free, he heard a hum that meant his bees were encircling them, 
Closer and thicker came the bees, forming a tall and deep surround. The hare jerked her ears and twitched her nose. She flitted on his lap and hopped about, but no longer tried to escape. Finally, the hare settled down once more. And then, the marvel of it. No longer was a white, blue-eyed hare on his lap, but a bonny blue-eyed lassie. Quickly, he removed the cord from around her neck. They laughed at the wonder of it. They did not know what to think. But as morning dawned, the bees were back in their hives. The geese were winging over the moor, and the lad and his lassie were in the cottage, making plans to marry. An old man living in Alaska was sad. All of his friends and family were long gone. He began to wonder if he should leave the village and start a new life somewhere else. If I lived someplace new, at least I won't be around all these memories anymore, he thought. But he also worried, if I paddle away to another village and the people there see that I'm alone, they may think that I had to run away from my home village because I was accused of some disgraceful thing. Instead, he thought that he would just go off and live in the forest by himself. The poor man was so sad, traveling alone in the woods, it actually occurred to him to go to the bears and just let the bears kill him. The bear village was by a large salmon creek, so he went over to the creek early in the morning until he found a bear trail and he lay down across the end of it. He thought that when the bears came out along this trail they would find him and that would be the end of him. By and by, as he lay there, he heard the bushes breaking. Then a large number of grizzly bears came along. The largest bear led the rest. Then the old man became scared. All of a sudden, he realized that he did not want to die at all, and certainly not by bears. So when the leading bear came up to him, the old man stood up. He announced, I have come to invite you to a feast. At that, the leading bear's fur stood straight up. The old man thought that he was surely done for, but he spoke again, saying, I have come to invite you to a feast, but if you are going to kill me, I am willing to die. I am alone. I have lost all of my family and my friends. As soon as he had said this, the leading bear turned around and growled to the bears that were following. Then the group of them turned back the way they had come. After a while, the man turned and walked toward his village very fast. He wondered if the biggest bear had told the bears behind him to go back and get ready because they were invited to a feast. Well, in case that's the way it is, I better get ready to make a feast, thought the old man. As soon as he got home, he started to clean up. He took away the old sand around the fireplace and replaced it with clean sand. Then he went for a load of fresh wood. When he told the other people in the village what he was doing and why, they were all very much scared. They said to him, What made you do such a thing? The grizzlies are our enemy. You do not want grizzly bears in your home. When he was back home, the man took off his shirt and painted his chest. He put stripes of red across his upper arm muscles, a red stripe over his heart, and another across the upper part of his chest. Very early in the morning, after he had thus prepared, he stood outside of the door looking for his bears. Finally he saw them at the mouth of the creek, led by the same big grizzly bear. When the other village people saw the bears, however, they were so terrified that they shut themselves in their houses. But the old man stood by his door to receive his guests. He brought them into the house and gave them seats, placing the chief in the middle at the rear of the house and the rest around him. First he served them large trays of cranberries preserved in grease. The large bear seemed to say something to his companions, and as soon as he began to eat, the rest started to eat too. They watched him, 
and did whatever he did. The host followed that up with a course of salmon, with sprinkles of clover weed and dandelion on top for garnish. Then a course of deer meat with pine nuts. For dessert, raspberries with honey. After they were through, the large bear seemed to talk to his host for a very long time. It was almost as if the leader bear was giving him a speech, for he would look up at the smoke hole every now and then and act as though he were talking. When he finished, he went over to his host and licked the paint from his arm and chest, and so each of the other bears in turn did the same. The old man felt as if they were licking his sorrow away. The day after all this happened, the smallest bear came back to the old man's hut in human form and spoke to the old man. He had been born a human being, he told the old man, but had been captured and adopted by the bears. This bear man asked the old man if he had understood their chief, and he said, No. He was telling you, the bear man replied, that he is in the same condition as you, that he too is old and has lost all of his friends. He had heard of you before he saw you, he said. He told you to think of him when you are mourning for your lost ones, as he knows how that is too. When the old man asked this bear man why he had not told him that day, when the bears were at the feast, he replied that he was not allowed to turn into his human form and speak his native language while the bear chief was around. After this, whenever the people of the village gave a feast, they would always invite an enemy to the feast, and they would become friends, just as the old man had done with the chief of the bears.